right at the last moment, it falls, or it's over. He's never coming back, and then he comes back. He transforms back into a man again. She says, I love you. Everyone cries. How many of you remember that part? You cried. You were like, man, this is so cute. And then the music starts going, that same music, and you're like, this is so good. And then he turns back into this like charming, handsome prince. But the, the reality is, is most of us actually woke up like the beast this morning. So we look like the beast. Don't lie. You got out of bed. You had Taco Bell last night. You're like, I'm not feeling good. You look in the mirror like, I'm the beast right now. But what happened was he didn't just tra- change from the outside. He actually changed from the inside out. So it, it was kind of this process because she didn't fall in love with the beast. She fell in love with who he was as a, as a person. He began to change. And it was this transformation that took place in his life that ultimately she said, I love this guy. I love his heart. And then he turns back into a prince, and they live happily ever after. And that is the conclusion of pretty much every Disney movie you'll ever see. It all works out. Finding Nemo, you name it. They all work out well for the prince, Belle, and for the beast, and for us. Because we get a couple tears in, we get to laugh, smile, our heart gets tugged on. But it reminds me of another story in the Bible of transformation. And there are a few stories of transformation in the Bible. One of my favorites and you know this story. It's the story of the prodigal son. And I'll just kind of give it to you real quick. It's, it's kind of similar. He's, he's a young man, and he's working with his father. He lives with his father. And his father has everything and he could possibly want. He was very successful, very wealthy. And you know what? He started thinking, man, he's... He should be dead by now. I mean, I want 50% of my inheritance. And so he's living and he starts thinking, what would life be like if I had all of this money and I had my inheritance? Have you ever thought that way? Like you buy a scratcher ticket or the lottery and you're like, what if I want a million dollars? You're like, man, I'd move my family. I, and I couldn't say this joke for service because my, my in-laws were here. I'd move my, my brother and my sister. We'd all live on the same street. I'd let my parents, we'd, I'd buy them a house and I'd buy my in-laws a house. Okay, maybe not the in-laws. Okay, maybe not the parents. Okay, maybe not buy anybody a house, but you start going crazy and your mind starts going. And that was like the prodigal son. He, he was just kind of fed up with life as he knew it. He, although he had everything he wanted, he had this desire for more. So one day he goes to his father and he says, listen, you ain't dying fast enough, Bubba. Why don't you just give me my inheritance and I'll leave? Just, I wish you were dead, essentially. And so what happens? He says, okay, here it is. This is what you wanted take it. The Bible says he goes off to the city. He lives it up. He lives life to the fullest. You guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you know how to live it up. Come on now. Everyone got quiet all of a sudden. It's it's not a bad thing sometimes to have fun, but he goes off to the city. He squanders all of his money. Left with nothing, he finds himself working and tending to pigs, and he's sitting there in a pig pen, and he has this moment where he realizes, the Bible says as he he looked at what they were eating, and he said, man, I wish I could eat that because I'm starving. I have nothing. I've lost everything, and I'm hungry. I would eat that if I could, and he has this thought, and he goes, you know what? Man, even the slaves and the servants at my father's house, they eat better than I'm eating. Man, they eat good. These pigs are eating better than I'm eating. I need to go home, so he comes up with this thought. I'm going to go back to my father as a slave, just a servant, because I know I'll be better off like that, and The Bible says the father sees him from far off. He meets him, and instead of making him work for anything, he goes, you're my son. You've always been my son. You will always be my son, and he elevates him back to sonship, and he throws this party, but you see the transformation happened in the prodigal son's life when he was in that pig pen, and he realized, man, life could be so much better than it is today. You know, it's an interesting, it leads me to a passage about transformation. The Bible talks about it a lot, especially Romans 12 too. Go ahead and check it out on the screens on your phones, on your notes. It says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This passage is saying that if you want to live the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God, you need to be transformed. But transformed from what? Brennan, I need to be transformed? Yeah, we need to be transformed. And here's what we need to be transformed from. The pattern of this world. Paul's saying, listen, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But we need to be transformed from the world's pattern. And the world does have a pattern. Paul's saying there's a pattern in the world. And there's a pattern that truthfully, 
we all seem to slip into. It's really easy. <clears throat> you see, Paul isn't saying, and this is important to catch, he's not saying the world is the problem. He's not saying, hey, we got this problem, it's the world. No, no, no. God loves the world. God loved the world so much, he sent his one and only son to save the world. The world's not the problem. It's the pattern of the world that's the problem. It's the pattern because the world is chasing after something. The world is chasing after sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I just wanted to say that because it's in a song somewhere, right? Isn't there like a rock and roll song like that? Someone's like, I know it. You don't want to say it because you're in church. That's okay. That's all right. But here's what the world is chasing after. Self-satisfaction, highs, whatever we want, our desires, affirmation, pleasure, material gain, money, accomplishments, never realizing that there's a pattern. And it's a pattern that I believe some of us are in and we just don't know it. It's what this world is chasing after. So how do we identify if we're falling into the pattern of this world? Because if we don't recognize the pattern of this world, we're going to experience life as a series of unrelated problems. We're going to move from problem to problem to problem to problem, never realizing we're stuck in a pattern of this world. And that's how most of us live our life, to be honest. Something bad happens, we go to prayer, Lord, help me get out of this problem. And then we find ourselves in another problem, like, Lord, give me some money, I'm broke. Then we get in another problem, God, I lost my job, and we're just praying from problem to problem to problem to problem, never realizing we're in a pattern. Because the truth is, if we can identify the pattern, we can live differently. But if we can't see the pattern, we will never be able to address the problem. And this is the first point. Our life is a product of our patterns. I mean, think about it. Think about it like this. If you get drunk and drive every day, how many of you know you're probably going to get a DUI, right? And I know that's a little extreme, so I'll kind of break it down and make it a little simpler for you. If you don't study for a test, how many of you know you're probably going to fail that test, right? If you don't pick up your house, your house is probably going to be dirty. So check this out. Your life is a product of your patterns. If you have a bad pattern, it'll affect your life. So if you want to change the product, if you want to change the product of your life, then you've got to change the patterns in your life. Are you getting that today? Come on. Somebody say amen. Wake up with me. That's what I'm, I just need you to say something so I know you're with me. You're with me today. I like it. The pattern of this world is contrary to God's pattern, though. Because if you're following the pattern of the world, your life is going to be a product of that pattern. But if you renew your mind and you do life God's way, then when difficult situations come, you're going to praise God. You're not going to be in the dirt. You're going to make, you know what? God's got a plan for my life. And then when you lose your job, you're going to say, listen, it's okay. God's got my back. Then when your family's going through health issues, you're going to say, you know what, this is, I'm going to be okay because God's got this because I'm following God's pattern, not the world's pattern. But if you're in the world's pattern, you're going to be down on your face going, what's going to happen? What am I going to do? I'm broke. I got nothing. I'm down in the dumps. But if you follow God's plan for your life, I promise you, you can walk through this life, every circumstance, every season of this life, praising God with joy. Come on. That's what we want today. We got to renew our mind. God's in control. Matthew 7, 13 says this, because most of us are thinking, well, Brennan, do I need to be transformed? Because like when I was 12, I gave my life to the Lord. I was at some summer camp, so I'm good, right? Like no, tra no transformation for me. I'm good. No, I need transformation sometimes in my life too. Sometimes someone cuts me off and I'm like, dude, I'm about to jack you up right now, bro. And then like, I need, God needs to transform me because I get in this pattern. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy. It's not good. We need transformation. I need transformation too sometimes. The Bible says this. Matthew 7, 13, enter through the narrow gate. And it's talking about those who are seeking God because it's a narrow gate. Not many people pass through it. But wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. The Bible's saying there's a road. There's a pattern of this world and many travel on it. It's a wide road. We all jump on it sometimes too. And it's easy to walk on. The pattern of the world is easy because everyone's doing it. So how do we know we've fallen into the pattern of this world? Because that's the real question. Okay, Brennan, I see that there's a pattern that it's easy to fall into, but how do I know that, that I've fallen into the pattern of the world? And in order to do that, we need to talk about what that pattern looks like. So these five steps are the things that the pattern of the world, I believe, produces in our lives. And the first thing, if you're taking notes, the first thing you'll experience if you're caught in the pattern of this world is disappointment. Disappointment. If you're following the pattern of the world, you're going to be disappointed. 
unmet expectations, displeasure caused by the non-fulfillment of one's hopes and expectations. You know, our culture today is so obsessed with self. Think about it. Self-image, self-actualization, self-love, self-sufficiency, self-esteem, self-satisfaction, self, self, self. It's all about me, what I want, what I want right now, how I feel. And if I feel this way, I want to do it. But what happens when the expectations of life and this pattern are unmet? We experience disappointment. I, I'll never forget being disappointed as a, as a, like a little boy and my dad saying, Brennan, if you don't want to be disappointed, don't get your hopes up. So don't think you're going to get it, and then you'll never be disappointed. You see, we chase after everything, yet we wind up disappointed and dissatisfied because it seems to never be enough. We get what we want, but once we get it, for some reason, we'll, we're still left disappointed. We, we'll have the, the car, right? I remember when I bought my first car by myself. I was like, this is so awesome. And then I was like, wrote that check for the money. I was like, I don't even like this car that much. Why didn't I get a sunroof? Man, I need to go. I need to get a new car now. I wasn't satisfied with it. But in the moment, I, I had to have it. I want that. I have to have it. That's what I want. But we're always left disappointed with our jobs, our finances, our career. You're dissatisfied with where your career is taking you. You're dissatisfied with your relationships. You're disappointed. And the truth is, I think some people, and I believe God told me someone here today is disappointed with themselves. You look in the mirror and you're disappointed with the person you see. You don't think you measure up. And it's largely because growing up you had people tell you that you weren't good enough or that you, you, you felt like you weren't meeting their expectations. And so you're just disappointed with yourself today. But the truth is, is we can change our pattern. We can change the expectation. You've believed the pattern that says you're not this way and you're not good enough. And I think the second thing that we'll experience if we're caught in the pattern of this world is discouragement. I think we're going to experience discouragement. What's discouragement? It's a loss of confidence or enthusiasm, dispiritedness. Things that once brought you happiness and joy no longer bring you the same satisfaction they once did. A lot of times our discouragement is largely in part to the fact that we're too busy measuring ourselves up to one another. The very thing that once satisfied us no longer does because we're too busy focusing on what we don't have. Isn't that true? We see what we don't have and now we want it. The very thing we were happy for, we were satisfied with, we're not happy with. That house that, that you have, that you prayed for, and you said, God, please bless my family with this house, now it's not a blessing anymore. You're just discouraged. You want the next best thing. But it was once a blessing. That thing that was once a blessing is no longer satisfying you. You're discouraged. And I laugh at this one because a lot of parents, they thought like, I know what I'm going to do with my kids. I'm going to get them a leapfrog. It's on sale for $49.99. You know, $49 I'm going to get my son a leapfrog. He's going to love it. It is educational. It is going to increase his knowledge. And this is going to be a, a fun toy for him. But the problem is the kid gets the leapfrog. He's like, that's pretty cool. But then he gets his hands on an iPad. And then that leapfrog is the lamest thing ever. How many of you parents know what I'm talking about with kids? You're like, he doesn't even want that thing. I should throw that away. This thing is junk, right? And then I see this all the time. Parents will be like, okay, I I'll get him an Amazon Fire. It's, it's better. It's fire. It's $99 on clearance right now. They'll love it. And then they won't bug me anymore asking for my phone. So you get them the Amazon Fire. Like, this is an upgrade from the LeapFrog. They can download apps, you know, and they're kid-friendly. So they get the Amazon Fire. And then all you see is them doing, I want your phone. Give me your phone. You're like, bro, I got you that. And they're like, no, I don't want that. Because I know what you have. And this isn't good enough anymore. I don't want this anymore. I want that iPad. And you're like, I ain't about to spend $329 on you, boy. You better get in line, clean your room or something. But don't you know what I'm talking about? And we're that way too. We see what we don't have. In the moment we see what we don't have, we're no longer satisfied with what we do have. We're no longer satisfied. The very blessings in our life that we prayed for, now it's no longer a blessing. It's not good enough. Oh, God, what you gave me is not good enough anymore because I saw his car because I know how much money he makes. So that job that I was so thankful for, I'm not thankful for anymore. You get discouraged. We get disappointed. That's the pattern of this world more, more, more. It's just like us. We work so hard to get what we want, when we want it, 
We even fight for it, and sometimes we're unethical when we try to get what we want. Sometimes we cheat. Sometimes we steal, and we say, well, I deserve it. I deserve that. And then once we get it, we're not satisfied. It's not good enough. The pattern of this world is that you can satisfy yourself, but the truth is you can't. You can't satisfy yourself. I think of the woman at the well, and I love this story. She was thirsty. Some will say thirsty. thirsty. You say that again now. Thirsty like you mean it. Thirsty. Come on now. I'm th- give me some ice cold water. I'm thirsty. So there's a woman, and she's walking, and she lives in this village, and she was tore up from the floor up, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like She was tore up. This girl, was, she was jacked up. She had been married so many times and had so many husbands. She was on the pattern of the world. She was so tore up that she wouldn't even go get water from the well when everyone else did in the morning when it was cold. She would wait till it was like 106 in Bakersfield and you're sweating from every, every place, only God knows. And she goes to the well because no one else is there, right? And she's thinking, I'm gonna go to the well when no one's there because she was ashamed because she was a mess. She was tore up. We get tore up sometimes. I'm not you guys, I'm just kidding. No one in here is torn up. But she goes and she sits at the well, and about that time, Jesus is at the well. How convenient, right? And he, she goes, she's thirsty, and he looks over to her and he goes, hey, why don't you get me something to drink? And she's thinking, you're crazy, bro. Do you know who I am right now? You would not be asking me for a drink if you knew who I was. And he says this in John 4.10. He said, girl, if you knew who, the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. He says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. And so what'd she say? How do I get that water? I'm sick of coming here at noon every day. It's hot. Give me that water. She didn't get it, right? She didn't get that Jesus was talking about the pattern she was on. She literally thought like, give me some water that I'll never drink water again. Like, you're crazy. I think she might've been playing him a little bit. Like, all right, you, you idiot. Like, why don't you give me that water then? Like, so I don't have to c- keep coming here, you know? Then I, I'll really be the talk of the town. And he goes, no, you still don't get it. I'm not talking about what you need. I'm talking about what you want. I'm talking about the things that you want. I'm talking about your dissatisfaction, how you go from one thing to the next, how it's never enough, how you're discouraged, how you're never pleasing yourself because you're trying to please yourself. He goes, I'm going to get her. He goes, hey, bring your husband over here. He says this in the Bible. She goes, I don't have a husband. She still thinks she's got him against the ropes. It's like a boxing match. And he goes, that's right. You don't have a husband. You had five. And the guy you're with isn't your husband. And right now she's probably tripping, right? She's like, oh my gosh, how did you know that? She was thirsty. She was thirsty. She was thirsty for what she didn't have. So she'd go from relationship, and she's like, I don't like this guy. Like, psh, get out of here. I like this guy now. Oh, well, you're no good. You don't clean up. Boom, you're out of here. You know, she's like going from one thing to the next, and it's just like us because we're thirsty. Because we're thirsty. We joke about our kids being thirsty, but we're thirsty. We're thirsty. We're on the pattern of this world, which is I can please myself if I just have this, if I just have that. But the truth is we can't. We can't, we're hungry, we're hungry. We need to get off this pattern. She was caught in the pattern of the world that will always leave you discouraged and unsatisfied. The pattern of this world is one that's all about yourself. And here's a point I wanna make. If you make your life all about yourself, you'll never be satisfied because you can't satisfy yourself. You can have all the money you want and you won't be satisfied. You can have a new house, a new car, a new job. You still won't be satisfied. You can't satisfy yourself. Discouragement, disappointment, those two things left unchecked and unresolved, they'll lead to the third step, depression. You leave those things unresolved, you'll be led to depression. And some of you, you're here, you're going, well, what's the difference between discouragement and depression? The difference is, is with discouragement, It's found in specific areas of your life. You might say, I'm discouraged about my job. I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy with my marriage. I'm unhappy with my financial situation. But you can cover that up. You can hide it. You can throw it under the rug. You can move on. You'd be sitting down at your favorite restaurant and you're not thinking about it because you're stuffing your face. That's what I, right? You can move on past it. You can get over it. It doesn't really affect you at your core as much as depression does. Depression is when you wake up in the morning and your whole countenance changes. It's now affecting your whole being. It's now affecting your whole person. You can't hide it anymore. You've got friends coming up to you going, are you okay? 
are you okay? You don't seem okay. Are, are you okay? Because now the thing you tried to cover up, you can't. It's, you're so ingrained in the pattern of the world that it's affecting everything you do. It's coming up from your core. You're depressed. I, I remember, you know, you know what it's like when you have a hard night and you think, I'm going to go to bed and I am so happy that I'm going to wake up and it's going to be a brand new day because your mind is running a million miles an hour and you wake up fresh. This is when you get to the point of depression where you wake up and you're still unhappy. You're still discouraged. You're still disappointed. It's affecting everything in you. And the truth is, is if you have friends that are on the pattern of the world, they won't even know anything's wrong with you because the very act of them knowing something is wrong with you would mean they would have to know something is wrong with them because in their mind, you're doing the same thing the world is doing. You're chasing after everything in the world. Well, I don't know what's wrong with you. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know because they would need to recognize it in themselves. It's so deep that it's affecting everything you do. You're depressed. The outlook no longer looks promising. Your patience has dwindled. You're snapping at those around you. You're having trouble loving those closest to you. Clinging for hope. We look to satisfy the next desire with the hopes of feeling better. We think, well, if I just get this, my life will be better. If I just can get that, my life will be better. I love when I'm sick because I'm like, Baby, I'm sick. And my wife's like, what do you want for dinner, babe? Do you want anything? Do you want a massage? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like sitting there like, yeah. You know, I got this. <laughs> and she takes good care of me, right? And I'm a big baby. But you know what angry people do? I'm in a bad mood, so you better do what I want. And they resolve to always be that way for their whole life. Romans 124 says this. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart. Their desires were so strong that God said, and this is, this is serious right here. God said, listen, if you pursue me, you're going you're gonna to bear the fruit of being a follower of Christ. You're going to be joyful. But when you seek the world, I'm just going to give you over to that because you're going to reap what you sow. And if that's what you want, that's what you're going to reap. You sowed into that, so I'm going to give you over to it but now you're depressed. Now you're discouraged. And you get to a point where you lose all hope and you find yourself at a place of despair. You find yourself just complete despair. It's the complete loss of, or absence of hope. For a time you relied on the promise of hope, but now you're so far removed from the truth and you've chased the pattern for so long that you can't even imagine a life where you're happy. You've resolved to remaining this way for the rest of your life. Haven't you met people like that who go, well, I'm just unhappy. They, they are so hopeless that they say, this is just how I'm gonna be for the rest of my life. I'm just gonna be just unhappy my whole life. I'm just unhappy, that's the person I am. You know what, well, I just don't have patience. I'm just, I'm just unhappy. I'm just not a morning person. I'm just this, I'm just that. They've given up on all hope to changing, to being transformed. They give into it. They just give into it. Like, this is the way I am. That's the way I am. I don't, I mean, this is it. Transformation who? Transformation what? Romans 121 says this. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were were darkened. They got so caught up in the pattern of this world that they lost all hope. Their thinking became futile. There was no hope anymore for a better day. Their hearts were darkened. In their hearts, they thought, this is the way I'll be for the rest of my life. And some of us get to that place where we think, this is it. I can't go anywhere from here. This is just the way it's going to be. Their hearts are darkened. When you fall into the trap of despair, you say, I'm just an angry person. But usually by the time we've reached the stage, we know what we're doing is wrong, but we think our story has, has been written this way. It has to be this way. You say, this is my story. This is the way it is. But the truth is that if you couldn't change the pattern, then Paul wouldn't have said, don't conform to the pattern of this world. The hope is, is that Paul wouldn't say, don't do it if you couldn't change it. If that's just the way you were going to be, he wouldn't have said, don't do it. So we're not trapped. We're not caught up in this. We can be changed. But so many of us give into the pattern, even beyond the point of despair, which finally leads us to destruction. We stay in despair and we allow the pattern of this world to just lead us right to destruction. 
Destruction is the action or process of causing so much damage to something that it no longer exists or it cannot be repaired. Have you ever seen them tear down a house? I mean, they're doing this new, like, freeway that goes from the 58 to this other freeway that leads to nowhere. You get on that freeway, and you're like, I'm on Truxton. This, what the heck is wrong with this freeway? Like, this is pointless, right? This is the freeway to nowhere. Well, now they're, they're, they're doing it, and they're tearing all these houses down. Destruction is when you destroy something, you tear it down so much that it ceases to exist. Something that was once a home is no longer a home. It cannot be a home anymore. A kitchen that someone ate in is no longer a kitchen. A relationship ceases to exist. It has been destroyed. It cannot be rebuilt. That is destruction. And I know, I'm thinking, Brennan, you think I'm going to destroy myself? You think I'm going to wind up in destruction? I think that's a little much. Isn't that much? Well, you might not be physically destroyed, but your marriage might be destroyed. Your family might be destroyed. Your career might be destroyed. Some of you, are, you're teetering on destruction, and you know, you know it. You've got a marriage that's about to no longer exist. You've got relationships, careers that are about to no longer exist because you're teetering on destruction, and you know it, and we know it. We know when we're there, but we, it's like we're standing on a thin branch that's going to break, and we're like, I know it's going to break. I just don't know when, and it's going to break, and I'm going to fall, and I'm going to hit every branch on the way down, and I'm going to look like the beast. That's what we're doing. And we stand on it, and we know it, and we know it leads to destruction, but we just think, well, not now. I, I, can, I can live for myself. It's the pattern of the world. Remember what the Bible says. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. It's not narrow. It's not that few. Oh, few people will be led to destruction. No, why? And it says many people travel on it. We jump on that road sometimes. It's so easy to jump on that road, to jump into that pattern. Galatians 6, 8 says, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. What are you sowing into today? Are you sowing into yourself? Are you sowing into your own desires? Because if you do, you're going to reap destruction. I've experienced it. I'm thankful for God's transforming grace in my life. I've experienced loss. I've experienced destruction. Before I came to the Lord, I was a mess. I was tore up from the floor up. But God restored me. But I was on a road that led me to destruction. There are things in my life that cease to exist. God's rebuilt them, but they'll never be the same because I know where I've been. Paul understood transformation. He was on both sides of it. He understood being broken, but he also understood transformation. He understands it. So how do we experience transformation? You may be here today, you're disappointed. You're discouraged. Things aren't looking up. You're, maybe you're even depressed. And it's possible that you're hopeless. And I know there are people who also, you're experiencing destruction, you're teetering on destruction. But let's look at how we can be transformed. Because the truth is, is transformation is not just for the one who's been destroyed. I need you to hear this today. Because you'll sit here, and this is what we'll say in our heart. I know it because I do it too. I come in, God wants to speak to me, and I think, well, this isn't for me. Because I'm not, I'm, not I'm not on a road to destruction. The truth is, we don't need to just be transformed if we're destroyed. Because that's what we often think. We often think that when I've lost everything, and I'm at rock bottom, okay, now I'll pray for transformation. God wants to transform you when you're at step one. God wants to transform you when you're just disappointed. God wants to transform you when you're just discouraged because he knows that you can be better because the pattern of the world starts at step one. It starts at disappointment. We can be transformed from that. Do you believe that? Do you believe you don't have to be disappointed anymore? You don't have to be discouraged anymore? Don't wait till destruction. Say, man, how can I be transformed today? How can I be transformed now? So don't miss this. Don't miss what God has for you today. Don't wait. Because that's the world's way. We'll all wait until it gets worse. We've done that. We've been there. And we know how that winds up. We end up wishing we wouldn't have gone down that road. So how do we do it? How do we experience transformation? I think back to the prodigal son. Something I didn't share with you about his story. Nothing around him. He had this life-altering transformation. Think about it. He had lost everything. And he was transformed. But you've got to get this. 
nothing around him changed. We often think that transformation is, is catalyzed by something around us changing. Well, if I get more money, I'll be transformed. Well, if my mom quit breathing down my neck, I'd be transformed. Well, if my stinking boss would shut his mouth, I could be transformed. No, nothing around him changed. He was in the same pig pen. He was in the same slop of crap. I can say that in church. It's there. He was in that. The flies were flying around him. Nothing changed. His geographical location didn't change. His outlook didn't change. He was wearing the same clothes. It wasn't a button up. All right, he wasn't wearing skinny jeans. He was in the same junk that he was in. But here's what changed. His mind. He made up his mind. Look at this. Luke 15 says, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, when he changed his mind, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. So you want to be transformed? Here's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to change your mind. You've got to change the way you think. We can't keep thinking the way we're thinking. Stinking thinking. I just like saying that. Stinking thinking gets me in trouble because I was thinking the wrong thing. I was thinking I was mad at my wife, so I snapped at my wife. I was thinking I didn't like my job, so I said something I shouldn't have said. I was thinking I didn't like my financial outlook, so I didn't want to give. Stinking thinking. Your mind is the steering wheel in which directs your future. If you're thinking this way, oh, you're going to go that way. Oh, come on. If you're thinking about that girl, you're going to go to that girl. If you're thinking about that, you're going that way. Where are you steering your mind? Are you steering it towards God? Or are you getting caught up? Are you getting caught up? We've got to change the way we think. Romans 12, 2. Come on, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to renew your mind. Our thoughts are directing us somewhere. Do you realize that? We think just because we think it, it's not that bad. But our thoughts are taking us down a road we don't want to go on. We're directing our thoughts in the wrong direction. You can't be transformed. You can't expect to experience life if you're pointing your mind there. You've got to point your mind up, upwards on Christ. We've got to change the way we think. True transformation happens in the mind first. If you quit drinking, it's going to start in your head first, not your body. Matter of fact, if it doesn't start in your head first, it rarely lasts. Think about all those people. January 1, they're going to go get a gym membership. And on January 6th, they're going to be like, how do I get out of this gym membership? Because it didn't start in their mind. It started in their body. They looked at it like, I want to be skinny. But really in their mind, they didn't point their mind to it. If it doesn't start in the mind, it never happens. You cannot sustain it if you're not pointed at it. You can't go where you want to go if you're pointed over here. If I'm pointed towards that Big Mac, but I know I need Subway, if I keep looking at that Big Mac... I'm going to be eating that Big Mac. But if I point it at that foot long, I'm going to be staring down a foot long. You know what I'm saying? Where are you pointing your mind? Are you pointing your mind on Christ? Or are you stuck in the pattern of this world? You got to change the way we think. You can change your outfit, your job, your title, your financial situation. But true transformation happens in the heart. It happens in the heart and it starts up here. The second thing we need to do, and you might miss this, so I'm going to explain it. You need to change your pattern. You've got to change your pattern. If you're discouraged with the product, if you don't like the product of your life, then change your pattern, right? I hear people, they go, I'm broke. Change your pattern. They think the problem is the product. They think the pro, and this is like a math equation, and I know I might lose you guys, so I'm going to keep it at like first grade level so we can all do it, okay? Otherwise, if I bumped it up to second grade level, I'd make a mistake. Matter of fact, I was in first service, my wife's a math teacher, and she was like, Brandon, you, you made a mistake. The product is when it's multiplication. I'm like, okay, babe, all right, math teacher. And my father-in-law, too, is a math teacher. I'm like, get out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Check this out. The pattern is two times two. The product is what? Say it. Come on. Don't be afraid. Four. If you don't like four, then you've got to change the pattern. 
If you want eight, it need, the pattern needs to be two times four. So the thing we do in our life is we say, I'm not a morning person. And I go, no, that's the product. Yeah. I got people who show up late and I'm like, come on, bro. What's wrong? They're like, here's what's wrong. I am not a morning person. And I'm like, bro, you've got a bad pattern. Quit staying up till 2 in the morning. Quit drinking coffee at 11.30. Quit yelling at your wife at 11.30 at night. <laughs> Otherwise, you ain't going to be a morning person because you ain't going to want to see her when you wake up. If you don't like the product, change the pattern. We've got patterns in our life that are creating products we don't like. And we sit there and we go, I just got to find out how to change this product, this problem. The problem isn't your product, it's your pattern. You've got to change your pattern. What is your pattern today? Some of you, you're here today and you're thinking, well, I'm just not a good student. No, you've got a bad pattern. You don't study. You think, I'm just not a nice person. No, you've got a bad pattern. You need to change your mind. Well, I'm just, I'm not this, I'm not that. You know, I don't like to give. No, you've got a bad pattern. You've got to change your pattern. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And what do we do with things we idolize? We go after them. What are you idolizing today? What pattern are you on? We've got to change our pattern. When we begin to idolize these things, we will stop at nothing to have them. And we have to change our desires. Which brings me to my next point, change your desires. Change your desires. We all have urges and desires, but when they drive our lives, we fall right back into the same pattern we were in, the pattern of this world. Our desire to be successful, affirmed, loved, usually leads us to destruction. Think about the prodigal son. What was his desire? I want money, and I want to go live in the city and party it up. So what did he do? He said, give me my money. I want to get out of here. His desire led him to destruction. Oftentimes, our desires lead us to destruction. We have to stop letting our desires control our mind and the road we're traveling on. We need to be focusing and desiring the right things. <clears throat> We've got to focus on the right things. Now, this fourth point I want to give you, I don't want you to miss it. And I know that it might sound confusing at first, but just hang with me. We need to change our test. We need to change our test. And you might say, what the heck are you talking about? And I get it. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Then, then you will be able to test. You're not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And once you do that, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, a good, a pleasing, a perfect will for my life. And, and this is what I think. I think that few of us know, if we were to be honest, we, we don't even know what it means to live according to God's will. I, I think that. I think it's hard if we were to be honest to say, well, what does that even look like in my life practically? How do I practically live for God? What is God's will for my life practically? We don't know how to do that. So what we do is we just live day to day. We wake up. I guess I work. I guess I do this. I guess I should be nice. But we don't know the will of God for our life. We don't know what it looks like. We're allowing our test for what's right to be how we feel. So because we don't know God's will for our life, we say, well, well what do I test my, my thoughts, my emotions, my feelings, my my direction, how do I know if I should go? How do I know if I should stay? So what we do is we test our feelings. We say, well, in my heart, I, I felt like it was the right thing, but I guess it wasn't. I guess it didn't work out. I thought he was a good guy. You know, I, I loved him in my heart, but it didn't work out. And the Bible says that our hearts above all else are deceitful. Did you know that? But yet we feel it in our heart. We have desires in our heart. We have urges in our heart, but our heart is deceitful. We need to change our test. Our test cannot be, do I feel like this is the right thing? You know what our test needs to be? God, I want to do your will for my life. Is your will for me to have that job, God? Because if it's not, close the door. You know, a lot of times we don't even pray that. We get a job offer, 
and we don't even say, should I take this God? We go, well, I make more money. But you don't say, God, shut this door if it's not your will, because I want your will done. God, if she's not right for me, if he's not right for me, just don't let it work out, God. I pray, don't let it work out. We don't even pray that. Well, I feel good about it, so I should do it. Our test becomes, how do I feel? Do I feel this is the right thing? And that cannot be our test. Our test will also become, well, you know, am I pleasing my wife? Because I, I just want to please my wife. No, we need to please God. Because if you please God, I promise you'll please your wife. Am I pleasing my boss? Well, I just need to please my, no, 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 you please God. You please God. Well, what if I lose my job? Then you lose your job, but you please God, and I promise he's got something better for you. He probably didn't even, he, he might have shut that door if you'd have pleased him earlier. He, if you'd have asked him before you got that job, God, I don't want, the, if, if this isn't right, shut it. He might have shut it. So now you're in a position, and you're thinking, do I please my boss or do I please God? We've got to start changing the way we think. We've got to change our desires. What are you thirsty for today? Come on, we got to change our patterns. If we don't like the product, we can't be doing it the same way. We can't be doing the things that are leading us to a product we don't want, and we need to change our test. That's how we be transformed. That's how you can be transformed. You can be transformed whether you're on the first step or whether you've been destroyed. So I don't care where you are today. We can be transformed, church. If you've been serving God for 30 years, if you've been serving God for a day, if you don't even know God, you can be transformed today. God wants to transform us. There's a pattern of this world. Many travel on it, the Bible says. We shouldn't travel on it. You know what it looks like when you're not traveling on the world's road? Joy. Immeasurable joy. In the midst of ridiculous situations. You might lose a loved one and someone might come to you and say, how are you smiling right now? Because I have the joy of the Lord. Because I know, I know the end. Because I'm just, I'm here to please God. I just want God's will to be done in my life. You lost your job. You're broke. How are you happy? God's in control. God's in control. He's had my back to here. He'll have my back to there. Come on, let's be transformed, church. Don't miss this. I told you not to miss it today. So much of our heart wants to pass over this. But what does it look like for you to be transformed today? Maybe your mind is wrong, and we can cover up our mind. No one knows what we're thinking but us. Maybe we need to transform our mind. Maybe we've had some thoughts that we need to just give to God and be transformed with. Maybe you've made some decisions that potentially are destroying things in your life and, and you, need to, you need to stop. And I want to encourage you today. I want to pray for you, but I want to encourage you today to be transformed, to analyze your life. God, what patterns in my life do I need to change? God, what things am I doing do I need to stop? God, where in my life do I need to just say, Lord, what is your will? Is this what you want me to do? Are you ready to do that, church? Are you ready to seek God? Come on, let's close our eyes and pray. Lord, I thank you so much for being here, for having your presence in this place, God.